In today's video, we'll see that slow wave sleep percentage loss over time is associated with an increased dementia risk. But first, let's do a quick introduction, including which sleep stage is SWS or slow wave sleep. And that's what we can see here. This is a sleep histogram. So starting from being awake, we pass through REM sleep. After REM sleep is stage one and stage two sleep, which is considered light sleep. And after that, we go into stage three and stage four sleep, which is slow wave sleep. Now in the first half of the night, most of the slow wave sleep happens there, as you can see by the green horizontal arrows. And in the second half of the night while asleep, you can see that slow wave sleep is considerably less, if at all, whereas the majority of the time that was spent in slow wave sleep is now spent in REM sleep. So with that in mind, note that slow wave sleep percentage, which is defined as slow wave sleep, the total divided by the total sleep time, that declines during aging. And that's what we can see here. This is a meta-analysis of 65 studies. And if you're interested in any of the papers that are referenced in this video, they'll be in the video's description. So on the y-axis, we've got slow wave sleep percentage. Again, the slow wave sleep amount divided by total sleep time. And that's plotted against age on the x. And this study included uh, people from five years old up to 90 years old. And here we can see that slow wave sleep in youth is about an average of 25%. Uh, well, that's in five-year-olds. So for about a 20-year-old, it's about 20%. But note that age-related trend line, you can see that it declines during aging, such that a 90-year-old, the average value for SWS percentage is only 8%. Now, the importance of the age-related decline for slow wave, slow wave sleep percentage loss is that it's associated with an increased dementia risk, as I mentioned earlier. And that's what we can see here. This is in a recently published paper. So on the y-axis, we've got the cumulative dementia incidence. So it's not just incidence of Alzheimer's disease-related dementia. It's also vascular dementia and any other dementias. And that was plotted against follow-up time. And you can see that starting from the initial assessment of slow wave sleep, about 17, with an average 17 years later, how, how many people had were diagnosed with dementia or not? So when ca compared with people who exhibited a slow wave sleep percentage decrease over that 17, average 17 year period, they had a higher incident risk of being diagnosed with dementia when compared with people who had a SWS percentage that was stable or actually increased over time. Now, note that a, a major focus of the channel is to optimize biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible. And apologies, apologies if I said that, you've heard me say that a billion times over the last few videos, but that's also a med, major premise of the channel. So with that in mind, slow wave sleep percentage can be tracked. And one way to track it is by using fitness trackers. Now I've got WHOOP up here, and I'm gonna show WHOOP data in comparison against polys polysomnography, PSG, which is a gold standard for sleep studies. And I'm not here to promote WHOOP. That's not the point of the video. Uh, if there are other fitness trackers, uh, Aura, Apple Watch, Garmin, Fitbit, et cetera, that have been compared against PSG for their ability to quantify individual sleep stages, including slow wave sleep and total sleep time, please po post those papers in the comments uh, and I'll be happy to compare and potentially include that data in a future video, just focusing on other fitness trackers and, and their ability to quantify slow wave sleep and total sleep time. In this video, I'm only gonna focus on WHOOP data as I've worn that for more than five years. So let's see what the data has, has to show. So here we're gonna look at individual sleep stage data in terms of minutes per night. And again, this study, I'll put this, uh, the, rep, the link to this paper in the video's description. And we're going to compare it, WHOOP against PSG, again, polysomnography, which is a gold standard for sleep studies. And that's in part because we, uh, people get all electroded and, and strapped and, and deviced up. You can see, uh, see on the finger, it's uh, pulse oximetry. And the net sum of these electrodes monitor brain waves, but also eye and muscle movements, heart rate, heart rate, breathing, respiratory effort, and oxygen saturation. So again, PSG, long story short, is that it's the gold standard for sleep studies in terms of quantifying individual sleep stages and total sleep time. So how does WHOOP compare? So what we care about with focus on this video is slow wave sleep duration. So WHOOP in this study was able to quantify 80 minutes, uh, an average of 80 minutes per subject, whereas PSG calculated it as 84 minutes. And we can see looking at the p-value that those two groups of data were not significantly different. So what that indicates is that WHOOP is as good as the gold standard PSG for detecting and quantifying slow wave sleep. But what about total sleep time? Because we'll need that to calculate the slow wave sleep percentage. 
So that's what we can see here. Whoop calculated 359 minutes per person on average. PSG calculated 350, about 350 minutes per person on average. And these data too were not significantly different. So from this plot, we can see that Whoop's slow wave sleep and total sleep time calculations are as good as the gold standard for sleep studies, which is PSG. Now, where Whoop is not great is for uh, quantifying REM sleep. And we can see that Whoop in this study calculated 104 minutes on average per person, whereas PSG calculated 89 minutes on average per person. And this was a significant difference. In other words, Whoop overestimated REM sleep, uh, it overestimated it by about 15 what do we got there? It's uh, 16 minutes or so per person. So if the goal is to track REM sleep over time, WHOOP may not be the best bet for that. But in terms of slow wave sleep and total sleep time, as good as the gold standard PSG. So with that in mind, what's my data? As I mentioned, I've been tracking, uh, I've been wearing WHOOP for many years, so I have data for slow wave sleep and total sleep time. In, so I can calculate the slow wave sleep percentage and we can see if I've declined or not during aging. So here we're gonna take a look at, again, slow wave sleep percentage from May of 2019 through early November 2023. And you can see that little n is, this is more than 1,600 days of data, which is what we'll see here. So I'm only gonna go through year by year averages, but note that each dot refers to an, a single day's worth of data. So in 2019, average slow wave sleep percentage was 21.2%. In 2020, the average full year average, 21.3%. 21, and rather than just looking at year to year averages, superficially they don't look different, we can evaluate that with a two sample t test. So when doing that, these two groups of data, 2019 versus 2020, not significantly different. So at least no age related decline year over year, 2019 versus 2020. In 2021, average was 21.5%. Uh, and again, using that two sample t test, not different from 2020. So no age related decline for at least two years, starting with the 2019 as my baseline. But then in 2022, I was able to increase it to 24.1%. And that's significantly better than 2020, uh, 2021. And similarly, thus far in 2023, I've been able to increase it a bit further to 24.8%. And again, when evaluating it uh, statistically to sample t-test, the p-value is 0.002, so less than 0.05. In other words, 2023's data is uh, significantly longer than 2022's data. So the net sum of this, these data is that I've significantly increased slow wave sleep percentage since 2019, which is potentially good news, especially in terms of dementia risk, which for people that exhibited uh, a slow wave sleep percentage decline over time, they were at a higher risk for being di diagnosed with dementia relative to people whose slow wave sleep percentage was stable or actually increased over time. So then the next question is how? So one variable that may be underlying these data is body weight. And here we're gonna take a look at correlations for slow wave sleep percentage with body weight as I have daily body weight data that corresponds to slow wave sleep percentage over that 1600 day or so period. And that's what we can see here. So, so on the y-axis, we've got slow wave sleep percentage plotted against body weight in pounds. And note that uh, my fasted body weight, I record that uh, every morning after using the bathroom. So what we can see on this plot is a significant inverse correlation. You can see that p-value is less than 0.05 and the co correlation coefficient, the little r, is negative. And what this suggests is, or what this shows is that a relatively higher body weight is significantly correlated with a lower slow wave sleep percentage in my data. It may be different for others. Conversely, a relatively lower body weight is significantly correlated with a higher slow wave sleep percentage. And over the past two or two and a half to three years, I've been slowly reducing body weight, which may be one factor that's underlying the improvements uh, in slow wave sleep percentage over that three or so year time span. Now, even within body weight, we can further subdivide that into calorie intake because maintenance of body weight is going to involve, are you in a caloric excess, caloric you know, deficit? Uh, but then we can further subdivide calorie intake into diet composition. What's the diet composition that may correlate with slow wave sleep or does it at all? Maybe it's just calorie intake and body weight. And then also inherent in the body weight cal calculation is daily activity levels. So I intend on covering each of these in a future video, correlations with slow wave sleep percentage, so we can really get after, is it body weight, is it calorie intake, is it, is it total activity levels? Stay tuned for that in a future video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. 
And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for at-home metabolomics, NED quantification, epigenetic and telomere testing, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing, including ApoB, green tea, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, which I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.